Raise your hand if this is the first time that you've attended One Million Cups. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Courtney. I'm a community organizer here at One Million Cups along with Britton, Milton, and Brian. One Million Cups is a weekly entrepreneurial program. We have two presenters that get up and present for six minutes, and then we will open up questions from the panel and then to the audience. So if you have a question for the presenter, please raise your hand and we will come around with a mic. I would like to welcome our expert panel. I think they're gonna get up and tell us a little bit about themselves. That's exactly what I was gonna do. Uh, my name is Adam Arredondo. I am the Director of Entrepreneurship for SEED, which is the Center of Entrepreneurial Ecosystem Development. Basically a fancy phrase for Startup Community Builder. We uh, are managing uh, Village Square, which we'll actually have a little announcement at halftime. We have a grand opening coming up. And put on uh, entrepreneurial events for students are our two big, big priorities. Also a co-leader to the Kansas City Startup Village. I guess if he stood up, I have to stand up, darn it. I'm Shelly Kramer, I own a company called V3 Integrated Marketing. I'm a brand strategist. I've been working in the Kansas City area for a really long time, and um, my expertise is really all about helping clients leverage the web for growth and profitability. So, um, and I work with a lot of entrepreneurs and startups, and I like picking things apart, which you may or may not notice later. <laughs> Thank you. And with that, we will get started with our first presenter. I would like to welcome Vila Plus and Maps Coffee Roasters, Vincent Rodriguez, Julie Pellino, and David Dye. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you to the Foundation and One Million Cups for inviting us here today. My name is Vincent Rodriguez. This is David Dye and Julie Pellino. Uh, this is three quarters of Vila Plus and Maps Coffee. We, uh, we have a bike shop in Old Town Lenexa. In this bike shop, we have a coffee roastery, and I'll tell you a little bit about the story here. But uh, our tagline is bikes, coffee, and sometimes beer. So really the story of Vila Plus and myself is, um, you know, I had a history with another coffee company for 18 and a half years, and I love coffee. And cycling has always been in our family. And a couple years ago, I had this challenge, um, a yearly challenge where I would uh, do something really momentous a couple years ago, I ran 500 miles. Uh, the year after that, I learned how to bake bread. The year after that um, was uh, bikes. And so last year was coffee and, and so on, roasting coffee and, and so on and so forth. But bikes really took a, a hold uh, with my creative side. And so what I decided to do was to uh, learn a little bit more. I spent the first year building 13 bikes. Um, so, you know, a part of my career, if I go back a little bit, part of the career was I needed a challenge and change to do something different. So to grow personally and professionally. So I decided to leave this coffee company and open my own, as well as a bike shop. So really the goals here and the problems that I was solving was to create a, uh, a unique bike shop um, that was welcoming, that was friendly, that you could get a great cup of coffee, you could sit down and maybe watch a cycling event on TV and whatnot. And most importantly, let's ride bikes together. And so that's what we created. So in order for, for me to get ready and really be prepared for the bike shop experience, I went to two schools. The first one was a frame building school called the Bohemian Frame Building School out in Tucson, Arizona. And the second one, the week right after that, is Boot Coffee in Mill Valley, California. And that's a coffee roasting school. And I learned a vast amount of experience and I used that when we opened in June of 2013. Uh, so like we talked about, you know, the goal was to connect with people, have fun, ride bikes, drink coffee, and Asterix beer. We'll get to that here in a second. So our bike shop, um, again, we sell retail bikes. Um, obviously, we have Surly Kona, All City, uh, Linus Fixation. We are a full service bike shop, so we can do tune-ups, we can do overhauls, custom builds, and whatnot. But we're also frame builders. So Julie and I are partner frame builders in the shop. Um, and what that means is we take tubes, and we cut these tubes, we miter them, hand miter, and we weld them, and we create, this bike is Julie's bike, and this is my bike, and my frame, and this is a Surly uh, ice cream truck that we sell in the shop. So obviously we're doing things differently. Um, and the customers have uh, told us that they like what we're doing and how we're doing it. So uh, I'll, I won't go through all this, but really what you need to know when it comes to custom bicycles, it is a custom frame. It's not cheap, but it is a handmade to your specifications. We use tools that are specific to frame building, such as the jig, bike CAD, and, and other uh, materials as well. 
So there's a lot of science that goes into building a bike, a handmade frame, and it takes roughly anywhere from 40 to 60 hours to make a handmade frame. It's not perfect, but it is a handmade frame. That bike also, this particular bike is a Richard Sachs Lux steel frame that I made for a guy named Harrison. That bike weighs about 18 pounds. There's a misconception that uh, uh, steel bikes are heavy and they're not, they don't have to be. So coffee, uh, and I did bring my coffee presentation, so the idea of coffee is, having worked with this other coffee company, I understood the power of uh, coffee, the connection, the community, uh, the relationship with coffee from tree to cup, and I wanted to do that in my own way. Uh, what I did uh, last year in January, I bought a really, really nice roaster called the Loring Smart Roaster. It's the world's most efficient coffee roaster, and that's a picture of it there. Um, I decided to name my coffee company Maps, because Maps pair really well with uh, bicycles and destinations, and to me, Maps tell a story. And we have a big map in the shop, and you know, I like to tell the story of that. Um, what we've done with the coffee company is, and again, I want to clarify, we are coffee roastery and not a coffee shop. However, we do offer and serve free coffee when you come into the shop. So part of the experience is we will invite you to either have coffee or iced coffee now and a, a beer. We have a beer fridge that uh, we don't, um, well, we don't sell our beer, we give it away. All right, so a part of the umbrella of coffee is bike shop blends and I have an example on the table over there. So there are coffee specifically uh, engineered or designed for bike shops. Um, and then I have another brand that I'm gonna launch and that's my novelty coffee brand. I'm not quite ready with that one, but Maps Coffee really focuses on single origins, blends, um, and high-end um, offerings. So my coffees that I offer are obviously single origin, direct trade, organic, shade grown. What we do differently, and again, a part of our bike shop and coffee roastery, what we do so well is we're very hands-on. I love sharing my knowledge and my passion of both bike and coffee. So that roaster sits on the sales floor. Um, I have a program called the Guest Roast where you can come with me and roast coffee, and it's about an hour and a half experience. And we'll talk about the coffee from its growing stage to the harvesting stage processing, and then of course the roast. So what you leave with is a blend of coffee that we roasted to your liking, your specification, and it's your roast. So the same thing with the custom blend, so they match really and pair well, really well together. Um, and then lastly, uh, we have coffee classes, pairings, roastings, and brewing. Cafe, I decided to put a hold on the cafe because there's a lot going on in the space and the goal is for the next shop to do the cafe. Now obviously with my um, coffee experience, that's the one thing that I'm the most comfortable with, but I'm waiting on that for the next shop. And sometimes beer. So some, David, um, the brewmaster in the shop, uh, we had this idea to do a, uh, a brew night and inviting people to share the story of how we do things handmade. And over the course of the last year and a half, um, we brew beer um, and we, um, we have a good time. So, uh, on open shop nights, we invite people to come in and, and learn about brewing, and we drink beer, and we brew beer, and we bottle beer, and have a good time. So really the focus there is that we're engaging with our customers and creating connections, uh, again, with no other bike shop that's doing, I mean, that, no other bike shop is doing that as well. So lastly, um, the handmade community. So again, from a frame building perspective, uh, we have classes with bicycle maintenance. We've had a women's bicycle clinic. We, uh, tonight is our open shop night where I have two students in frame building, so we'll cover frame building as well. Um, we have 10 plus local relationships that we do business with. Obviously, made in Kansas City, this hat is a locally made hat. Uh, the frame bag is a locally made frame bag. Of course, these are locally made as well. So uh, we believe in the partnerships that we're working with, and we're actually uh, building that as the Kansas City Bicycle Collective. So two weeks ago, we went to Louisville to a really, really big handmade bike show, and uh, we uh, bought the booth, invited some folks out, and a part of our success was telling the story of how we're collaborating together and working together on bicycle-related items and products that are made locally in Kansas City, and it was a hit. People really appreciated how we did it and what we offered. So obviously Julie's making her, she showed at the new builder table. ATM Handmade Goods makes this bag here. Um, Teddy Hog Hats, Lever Plus Townie Syndicate makes a tool here locally in Kansas City. Five Points has bike accessories um, that we showed. And then lastly, Alpha Laser, uh, Richard Poole, he's the illustrator of all things bicycle related, so. Uh, again, I'm the owner, roaster and uh, frame builder. David Dyes is the bike shop manager. Uh, we have Tim who is actually at the shop right now, he's our mechanic. Uh, Julie is the uh, frame builder as well. 
And then we have a couple other folks that help us out from time to time, but really the core of us is just the four of us in the shop. And then lastly, I wanted to share this slide of people and the relationships of bikes. And this is really important because we take a picture with our customers with their bikes. It's a new bike day. New bike day is a really, really important uh, um, uh, occasion. So when people get to share in bike, uh, cycling and, and whatnot. So, and there we are. Thank you so much. So Panna, what questions do you have for us? All right, so uh, that presentation was incredibly helpful uh, because I had a bunch of questions that you more or less answered. But I, I think that leads me, so last night when I was kind of checking it out, it's, I love the combination of uh, coffee, bikes, and beer. Um, but one of the things I would say is how are you marketing yourself? Because as an outsider, never having heard when I saw that, I was kind of left wondering, how does this combination work? Right. At least what, and maybe you're working on the website or something. Sure. So we have two websites. One is Velo Plus, the other one is Maps Coffee, and they both work in conjunction with each other. There's a link that takes it to each other. Our main focus was to primarily, uh, since we opened as a bike shop, is to get really good at bike shop operations routines and, and being known for what it is that we do and how we do it. <laughs> Uh, the roastery, uh, even though I've had it for a year, it's only been live since October. So the, the coffee side of the business is brand new. We're still in the startup phase with coffee, and we're in the growth phase with Velo Plus. So to answer your question, over the last year and a half, we focused on radio, print, newspaper, and a lot of different avenues with marketing. Moving forward, um, we're going to focus on social media and making sure that we have events and making sure that we get people in the store and aware of uh, what it is and uh, what we do and, and how we do it. So we're still working on a strategy, but what I'm convinced of is that people need, they, they like pictures. They like to see the story of what it is that we're doing. And so Velo Plus KC, hashtag Maps Coffee KC, we're telling those stories through Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Cool, and, and along with the social, I would, I would recommend uh, the website as well, because actually my list of questions, <laughs> I, I'll tell you what they were, my first impressions. Um, it was, are you a coffee shop, place to purchase bikes, brew pub? I don't know what the main reason I'd go to Velo Plus is, sure. was the first question when I came to the website. So, um, okay, and then, yeah, so now it's a lot more clear. <laughs> but honestly, some of the stuff you say, um, I would just put that on the website. Right, right. Good feedback, thank you. I really am a very nice person. I want you to know that okay. up front. And sure. everything I say is, is with love and intended to help you. Sure. But you gotta figure out what you're selling. Okay. And I, I think it's neat. I love coffee, sure. I love beer, sure. and I like bikes, sure. okay? So, so I have a couple things. First of all, you said your, your marketing was print and radio, and what else? Well, we've had right some, now? Other, some other local, um, you know, um, things that go out in mail, dip, local mailings and okay. whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, how many of you, when you want to buy a bike, read the Kansas City, read a paper, read advertising? Raise your hand, please. How many of you listen to the radio every day? Raise your hand, please. Awesome. More. I don't. I don't. I listen to Spotify or some stupid music that my kids put on my iPhone. But, but my point is, when I want to buy a bicycle, the internet is my friend. Absolutely. Okay, so when the first thing that I did when I was preparing this morning, not last night, like my overachiever co-panelist, um, I went to your website. And on the home page of your website, the first thing I found, I really am a pain in the neck, is we couldn't find the page you were looking for. There is an error in the URL. By the way, this is on the home page of your website down underneath your address. I mean, down underneath. Okay. I mean, so, so it's the first thing I see Sure. Not below the fold. So I'm like, okay, they don't get it. Okay. And um, and there's nothing. Oh, somebody's calling me. Uh, there's nothing on your website that tells me your story. And I think your story is interesting, but you happen to get us right here sure. as your captive audience. Sure. You know what? When I'm looking for bikes in Kansas City 
and expertise with regard to custom bikes. By the way, I know that a custom bike isn't cheap. I got money, I wanna spend it, make it easy for me. You don't do anything on your website to tell your brand story. Sure. And so I would venture a guess that to me, when, when I work with very large companies or very small companies, the first question that I ask is, where's the money? I would venture a guess that the money is not in coffee. So it's neat that you like coffee, sure. and I, everybody here likes coffee, but if the money is here, right. do this well sure. and make money at it, and tell your story and market it and get serious about that, and then add the fun other things that you're interested in, like the beer, and you know, see what I'm saying? It's sort of like you have ADD okay. with your brand, and, okay. and you don't want that. You really need to focus on, what your passion is, what the three of you, what the four of you, if you're three quarters of your team, what you're passionate about, what you do well, and how you're gonna make money to support yourselves. Right. So, so I would say that, and, and I just felt like, you know, again, for me, since, since I, I, I'm a strategist and I truly believe that, you know, what people do is when they hear about you, right. whether if they're driving in their cars and they hear about this cool little shop, and I happen to live in Lenexa, so I, or I think that, you know, your whole homemade and your passion for that, that's attractive to a lot of people. Absolutely. And you're a spendy item, okay? But the first thing that almost all of us do when we run across you is we pick up our devices or, or go to our laptops and we look for you online and so when you don't represent yourself well there then what we think is what else might you not be paying quite as much attention to because there should be nothing more important than telling your story right because I can't buy it if I can't learn about it so so I would say that you know you have to do that and and on your website you know I see and again I'm I'm understand that you know, there, there are a lot of things, that, there are a lot of holes that entrepreneurs and sometimes established business owners fall in. And one of them is it's okay to have a crappy website or it's okay to use Wix or it's okay to use some other cheap, free, do-it-yourself, sure. whatever. Well, the website is the hub of all your business operations. That's the one place that you shouldn't scrimp and you don't have to spend ten thousand dollars to have a good website but you know i look at your website and i go you know i click oh they have a blog that's interesting because i read blogs all the time and i love cycling and i want to see what they have to say about what's going on in cycling and what bikes i should sure. be spending my money on and i have nine-year-old twins that need bikes maybe i need to buy them custom bikes i don't know you know what i'm saying i mean there's but so i click on the blog and there's nothing there sure. except your presentation at you know here or I, you know, and, and I, I, lastly, I have to say, with regard to your comment about um, marketing moving forward, you know, please know that social media is a teeny, 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 tiny bit of where you should be focusing. It's a, it's a tactic. It's not a strategy. And you have to be willing to spend, I mean, you have to have a vibrant web presence before you can step into the social space. Yeah. And you can't just be using social to share pictures or to talk about a sale or whatever. I mean, you have to be willing to spend time and commitment. You know, when you look at local businesses that have managed to leverage social, somebody like Snow and Company or something, it's because they spend hours and hours on that. It's not just an afterthought. So yeah. I would really focus on getting your web presence in shape asking yourself what it is we're really serious about, what it is that we can make money doing, how we can be really, really good at that, sure. where our customers are. You know, you don't know, you know, you don't know where your customers are. Are they on Facebook? Great, if you wanna reach them using Facebook, I hope you have a budget for that because otherwise they're never gonna see anything that you post. So, so ask yourself strategically some questions to get moving in the right direction. I think that, you know, I think you have a really neat group of concepts, sure. but it's confusing to people from the outside looking in what it is that you really do. Okay. Thank you for the feedback. Before, before you go, Adam, we're going to go ahead and open it up to the group. So if anybody has a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Uh, we'll be coming around with a mic. <clears throat> and while we do that, Adam, go ahead. Hi, I'm Adam, and I'm the nice parent. Um, uh, 
Um, so clearly, uh, your revenue is driven on the bike side right now. Um, I was curious how you may have um, uh, started plugging into, I'm not any part of the bike community, but I imagine there is one. Um, I've heard of 816 Bike Collective. Uh, how have you guys started tapping into what I'm sure is some grassroots bike community in Kansas sure. City? So we partnered with Bike Walk Kansas City with their Women's Summit that they had here um, last summer. Uh, we've partnered with a couple of other local organizations, Bike um, Free Wheels for Kids, as well as put on events and other, um, other things that we're doing to connect with the local community here in town and in Overland Park as well. Uh, we're seen as um, a very helpful shop and friendly shop. We offer neutral race support, so for other uh, bikes, um, racers, and other teams that need support, we can actually solve a lot of problems for those guys as well. Yeah. Question in the center. Hi, my name is Chance. I love the presentation. I love the idea. It's very great. I hope you guys have the most of success. Thank you. During your presentation, you said you get um, that people that buy your product love your product and give you great feedback. Feedback is the most important thing you can do. It lets you know whether you're doing right, whether you're doing wrong, and where to go in the future. How do you look for feedback, or is it just in conversations with your regulars you get feedback? How do you look for feedback from people that maybe aren't your regulars, or somebody that came in and goes, I'm kind of looking for a bike, I don't know, do you, do you go and look for feedback after the sale, or uh, how, how do you find out how good you're doing from people that aren't your regulars? Okay. So certainly, you know, we, um, we create the experience so that they're, um, they're more apt to give us feedback. We create that welcome environment while, during the, the sale, so to speak. Online, our Facebook and Google um, ratings are 5.0, so we get fantastic feedback. Uh, we are working on a strategy plan to be more specific on how we uh, follow up with our customers and ask them what we do well and what opportunities they would like to see or things that we need to uh, follow up with in the shop. So, Got a question up front for you. Um, just to follow up on branding, a couple of things you could do is um, you can call your, you know, you can say you promote a bike culture. Sure. And then you can throw everything under the sun under, under that and just you know, be a proponent of sure. building Kansas City's bike culture. Sure. Um, or you could call yourself a bike cafe or a bike brew house. Right. Um, and then, as you said, pictures are important, but I didn't see those till the very end of your presentation. And I really wanted to see those in the beginning when you started talking about the people coming in and, and um, you know, working, you working with the Women in Bikes program, et cetera. Sure. I really want to see pictures right from the get-go. Sure, it's good feedback, thank you. Got some questions over here. All right. This one's gonna be a good question, I know this guy. Right. Hello everyone, Bob Beer with the Royal Loyal. Hello. I have a suggestion and a uh, question as well. So, suggestion for the website, Anytime I visit a website, if you have a short, less than a minute intro video, which I don't think is too hard to do, okay. having that and introducing people what you do, sure. the, uh, people who connect to you, I think will, would help. Uh, my question is, you talked about hosting events. Mm -hmm. What kind of thought process or what do you do to host those events and ensure that they are a success for you? So we um, have done um, a Made in Kansas City Summit. The first one was actually in our shop. Outside of that, we had a handmade in Kansas City in our shop. Our floor space, and luckily the bikes are on wheels so we can just move that out of the way. So we have about a 1,500 square feet or so of usable space that we work with, inviting people with, um, with parties and events and whatnot. Um, so we promote that on Facebook, and we created events so that they can attend to the Facebook event, and uh, we are at about a 95% attendance rate um, on those events. Um, as a furniture builder, uh, I've realized a lot of people really dive into process photos and videos. And so if you show from just start to finish how you go from, you know, paper to finished product, sure. you know, you get welding in there, all that stuff is, is just great. And people really attach to that. And that starts to tell more of your story of like handcrafted, built specifically for you. So that's like made for your website, made for your video. Right. That's a great intro to what you do. Awesome. Thank you. Got a question here in the middle. Um, I'm an avid cyclist and I, I really love the frame because I'm frame business and everything. So get excited when I saw the Richard Sachs. Um, so for the people who know biking, they know who he is. He doesn't advertise or market or anything because he's got that, you know, reputation and 
all the business he can handle for the rest of his life. What is your vision for your bike side? And then a second question is, what synergies do you see with the coffee? I mean, I'm being a cyclist, it, but not a coffee drinker, I, I realize a coffee, beer, culture, bike. And do you see any, um, you know, I, I think taken away from the bike part out of that? Sure. So, so thank you. So Richard Sachs has been a builder for 40 years, and he's really good at what he does. I, great, great products. Thank you. Uh, so the strategy there is Velo Plus, Maps Coffee, and VRB Custom Bicycles are all separate entities, and they're all designed to grow separately. What I envision in the future as we begin to build out stores, the coffee roastery will begin to drive revenue. And what's unique about that is coffee is scalable. I can put it in grocery stores, have wholesale accounts, sell it in retail, uh, retail and bike shop uh, blends as well. So that business will grow separately and together with Velo Plus, which it could be its own bicycle shop. What's really cool about um, the idea is that we can mix and match uh, concepts. So there's places where we can go where maybe a full-on roastery doesn't make sense, but a full, just small bar and small um, uh, retail presence with bicycles does make sense. Uh, there's another shop where maybe beer and bikes make sense. And so really, you know, the, the brands are designed to grow separately of each other and independently of each other, but at the same time, right now, since we're a fairly new company, less than two years old, we have to have it all in one space. And so as we build other stores strategically with the brands that we, with what we're doing with frame building, uh, what we're doing with uh, the different bike brands, obviously you see we don't carry Trek Giant or Specialized or Cannondale. Not that they're not great brands, but they're well represented already here in Kansas City. These brands, are, people are sought after. They, they seek these brands, the Surleys and the, and the Konas of the world. So really the strategy moving forward is to continue doing what we're doing, get better at how we do it, um, fine tune the message, uh, and make sure that we are, um, we're known for both bikes and coffee, but separately a great coffee brand as well as a great bicycle uh, retailer as well. Got another question here in the middle. Okay, guys, I have a quick suggestion for you, especially that Shelly brought up, that there is no blog presence whatsoever. Sure. My suggestion for you, because I'm an active blogger, sure. is also bring in, is also show like a process of how you create a bike via blogging. Also, try to use some cus customer satisfaction, and in addition to that, some references, because those without having those things in there, that blog will be nothing. So those are some of my point suggestions for you. If you All have right. any questions, I'd be happy to talk, tell you more about them when after this presentation, after everything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we are down to our last question. So as a community, besides giving you su suggestions from a bunch of smart people in the room, what can we do for you guys? As I mentioned, you know, what, what I, my ask of you guys is when you think about bicycles, when you think about coffee, what we do differently is that we make bikes and we roast coffee. So if you're looking for that experience to learn more than your big box retailer, that's what we can do for you. Uh, for, uh, um, that's what you can do for us. On top of that is just help us with continuing to give us feedback on the changes that we'll be implementing from a, a marketing standpoint, from a website and blogging standpoint as well. And those changes and the feedback that you've given us already. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few announcements while I try to do a wheelie off this medium-sized bike over here. Uh, Adam, come on up with the Kansas City startup. What, what, what do you call it? Village Square. Village Square, yeah. sorry. Um, so a couple of quick announcements. Um, we're really excited to um, be uh, opening the Village Square, which is a new co-working space in the Kansas City Startup Village. The, uh, yeah. Um, so the grand opening is tax day, April 15th. So we figure free beer and food, everyone would love that. Um, it's hellovillagesquare.eventbrite.com. It's free. Um, and just want everyone to come by, check out the space. We'll have bags and games, and it's really just a casual thing. If you haven't been to the village, 
it's a great time to come and check out the village as well. So it's April 15th, hellovillagesquare.eventbrite.com. The other announcement is Startup Grind is coming up on April 9th. Um, we're hosting Ron LeMay, which is um, a managing partner for Open Air uh, Equity Partners, which is one of the few VCs in Kansas City. Um, he also is CEO of FarmLink, which just raised, raised $40 million, one of the fastest growing technology companies in KC, as well as former COO of Sprint. Um, Startup Grind is just a um, kind of an intimate setting. We cap it at 50 people. Um, it is $10 a ticket, but we do cap it and want to maintain that conversational atmosphere. Again, beer and food is included in that $10 ticket startup grind on April 9th. Okay. So anyways, thanks guys. Thank you. Can you tweet uh, to one at CKC those, the details and the web addresses, please? Yeah. Marcus, you got that? Oh, there you go. <laughs> He's got it. Awesome. Thank you. Also, I want to mention, um, have any of you ever been involved in a startup weekend before? Got a few people. It's a really fun event. Um, it's theoretically 54 hours, but I have yet to see it spend all night on something. But um, this tonight at 6 p.m. at Sprint Accelerator, there is a startup weekend boot camp. And Jen is up here. And if you have any questions about this, this would be a very cool event if you're kind of interested in Startup Weekend and, and learning more and kind of being prepared to go to it. Is that correct? Startup Weekend is May 29th. Um, and where is it hosted at this year? At Think Big. OK, the new Think Big offices. Excellent. OK. On the back of your um, announcement sheet, we've got three different events listed here. So please take a look at that. Um, I must mention, if you're interested in crowdfunding, there's a meetup tomorrow night at the Interurban Art House in Overland Park, Kansas, and that's something that I help organize. So I'd love to have you there if you're interested in crowdfunding. That's Kickstarter or Indiegogo. And we're ready for our next presenter, Michael Lawrence. Did I say that right? Michael Lawrence with Gather. Welcome. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? Good. Good, excellent. So uh, my name is Michael Lawrence. I'm originally from Jackson. I moved up here after uh, coming to TEDx Jackson and hearing about Kansas City Startup Village from the former mayor of Kansas City, Joe Reardon. And so I moved up here uh, right away. It was a decision that spanned about a week, and it surprised everybody. Uh, so here I am. And I got to, uh, real quick, I've heard since I've been here that Kansas City is sort of a conservative area, and I gotta tell you, since I'm here now and I'm from Jackson, that I know some conservatives that would like put you guys to shame. <laughs> now, I know that there are some people in here who are thinking like, I'm conservative, but uh, to give you an example of like where I come from, uh, when they asked Jackson, Mississippi, if we wanted to get Google, Google Fiber installed, nobody raised their hand. Everybody folded their arms and said, we don't need any sort of fiber because we already got the best fiber there is, and it's delicious, <laughs> right? So that sort of gives you an idea of where I come from. Now, uh, the reason I'm here is because the event sharing industry is basically broken. Now, how do I know that? Because if I think it's broken, it's broken, right? And so you get to say the same thing, right? Especially you, Shelly. Kramer. So if you don't like my product, then you get to say it's broken, and then you can suggest a way to fix it. So uh, this is something that's broken. This is a culvert, and the engineer who built this is a fantastic guy, but the problem is, is that the fish can't swim all the way up those rocks and then jump into the culvert, right? So what they would like to tell him is that they need a culvert like this. I need to swim through it, but they can't speak, so they don't get a good culvert, and they stay on one side of the uh, culvert and die. So uh, this is the current dissemination of events, right? So the purple guy is the host up top. He sends out an email after creating an event on Eventbrite or something, or Facebook, and then his friends get it. They interact with it, and then they invite their friends, and so on and so forth. Now, the problem with that is that it pretty much doesn't work. So as you can see here, if somebody doesn't interact with a, or engage with a post or an, an, invita an invitation, then 
everybody who falls under them will not even see it. So that's the problem. So how do you know about an event? Uh, Eventbrite's current setup is that it, it basically turns events into a multi-level marketing thing where, you, as you can see, you turn attendees into promoters with an affiliate program. Uh, and so you basically burden your attendees with uh, a lot of like sending out invitations and things that really are actually the responsibility of the host. Facebook is no better. In Facebook, they just sort of suggest that you invite as many people as possible, which ends up in you ruining your reputation as a host and because you send out a lot of spam. And so you kind of wind up in the same category as people who send out Farmville invites. And that's never a good thing. <laughs> so this is the flow of information, right, for events. Somebody who wants to go and doesn't know, the event stops right there. The invitations go no further. If they don't want to go and they don't know, of course not, right? But if they want to go and they know, then it spreads because they engage with posts. And other people on Facebook see them engage with posts. I know you've seen the new, uh, well, it's not new anymore, but the timeline in real time up there in the top right, you can see when people are interacting with certain posts. So that is what you need. And of course, if they don't want to go and they don't know, yeah, same thing. So this is how you fix it. The host needs to get directly to the people who want to go. And that is what Gather does. So we kind of have this thing called Minos Paradox. And it says, how will you inquire into a thing when you do not know what it is? And so I'm here to introduce to you today, ladies and gentlemen, Gather's corollary, which is how will you attend awesome events if you do not know when and where they are happening? And we are the solution to that. Welcome to Gather, ladies and gentlemen. You can clap. So uh, Gather is a little bit different in that it allows more than just generic categories. As you can see, we have martial arts, skateboarding, tricking, gaming, b-boying, and all styles of dance. And so you can take your kids to events like these, and they can meet people like these awesome guys here, and they get to learn awesome things like this. Now, the way that we accomplish that is you set up, and I conveniently forgot these slides. I actually built this entire presentation this morning, like an hour ago. But uh, when you create an event, you will add some tags to that event. And when you add those tags, another person is going to sign up with a profile. And once they sign up with a profile, they put in their interest. And when the two match, they get an invite automatically. No middlemen, no multi-level marketing, no Eventbrite. And so you can go and like us on Facebook, and that is all our time. You got 20 seconds. Okay. What, what do you call that move you just did? Uh, that's called a corkscrew, sir. Corkscrew, OK. No more corkscrews on the stage, please. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and start with the questions. Uh, that was my first question. <laughs> okay. I want to see that again. Um, so uh, I guess first question is, is how far along, uh, or uh, what's usage, or is it up and running yet? Or what metrics do we have to kind of prove that this works? Right, so where we are now is that the platform itself is built. You can upload events, and you could come and discover new things. But the main selling point of Gather is you creating your own profile, and the event host creating an event, and you, the tag's just matching up. And so you basically create your profile, leave it, and then you get invites automatically by text or mobile phone. But right now, we just have it to where you can upload an event, and uh, you would have to manually sift through it, still writing the, you know, the interest algorithms and stuff. Yeah. So um, part of that, uh, obviously, I, well, you know, uh, I spent three and a half years building a event discovery platform and failed. It's a very challenging thing to do. One of the biggest things, oh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> but thank you. Um, one of the biggest things is the chicken and the egg problem, is you gotta have events on there for people to match to, and you gotta have people looking at the events for the events to get any attendance. So, um, and that's, we couldn't figure out how to overcome that. What are the things you're doing to seed events as well as get people to use the platform to attend them? Well, mostly I will be 
attending, as you can see, these events. Those, that's me. Oh, that works. So uh, I get to go to a lot of events like these, and we, you can do moves like a corkscrew. Uh, you, you know, kids come up to you, other people come up to you and ask you how to do things and stuff like that. It provides a lot of opportunity to connect, and uh, now I'm just here building the platform. So I've, I've got some people to talk to, you know. Right. So then, so then I, ex I um, imagine you want to expand into like live music and other stuff like that. Um, is that uh, what type of how, how do you get into that industry? Because obviously you listed the things that you have an in with, which is cool. Because I would talk to you if I saw you do that, you know, at a party or something. But uh, but like at, at a live music venue, how, what's the tactic to get into other industries outside of those niche ones that you have interest or connections right now? Well, so the interesting thing is that uh, guys like me, even though we have some very specific interests, those aren't the only uh, interests. You know, you might see me at Pizza Hut or something like that. We have lives outside of our niches. And so when enough people just get together, you know, we can't do things like that all the time. You know, we get tired or we get injured or, you know, <laughs> things like that. So uh, we just have like so many different interests that everybody who joins a platform is gonna bring something unique to the table. And we have a petition uh, community area of the of gather set up where you can actually petition for a kind of event that you want to see, and it can be as crazy as it, as you can think of. Like if enough fifty year old ladies uh, be request careful. to play, be careful. <laughs> I'd be like all three strikes. Uh, so. Uh, if a lot of those people want to play bridge, or, you know, 50 years young. Well, <laughs> what? What? He's got a microphone. You better be careful. I would careful, play bridge. Dude. I would play bridge. Do you have a mother? Can I have her phone number, please? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, if you like playing shoots and ladders or something, <laughs> then uh, you get your other people, your other friends that you play with to request that. And once we get enough uh, invites based on the percentage of users of the platform for a particular category, you'll see it pop up there. And that gives you a voice to host your events and spread the word about what you do. OK. I think you're awesome, except for that 50-year-old woman comment, which is, be careful, country, for many people in this room. OK, I'm just going to say that. Um, I love your, your energy. I love your personality. I like this concept. I'm not sure I really get it. Um, I want you to be successful. How do you make money? Uh, most of these events provide uh, tickets to sell, and so that will be We'll just cut a percentage of the tickets. OK, so your customers, your prospective customers are? A, just anybody who has a niche. If you do skateboarding events, martial arts events, seminars, breakdancing, things like that. Uh, okay. And we'll see what other things come up. I've been talking to a lot of people and getting them on board. Uh, the host of Red Bull Throwdown is on board with it. Jam Southern gatherings. I know this is all like, you know, you don't know what this is, but these are events where people pay money. So that would okay. be how we start. Okay, so if I want to have an event and I think you're cool and I see the corkscrew and I wish I could do that, but I can't, plus I'm wearing a skirt, uh, what, uh, how do I? how do I vet you, you know? Like, how do I, so I see you at an event and I think you're awesome, but where do I find out more information? Um, you mean if you're at an event that I'm at? No, if I run across you in some way and I think, wow, that's a cool concept, and I think, I, I'm ambivalent about Eventbrite, it doesn't bother me, but, um, but I see you and I want to know more. How do I, like, I can't go to Twitter because you're not really there. And I, I couldn't find you on Facebook, even though I saw that Facebook page and I didn't see a website. So how do I, like, if you're building this brand, how do you, how do people know about you? How do they find out more? How do they chase you down? How do they do business with you? Right, so uh, I'm a one-man team. So, like, things are going slower than I would like. Um, the main thing 
is just I'm going to send out information to people that I have connections with and also everybody in here now knows. So I'm going to be doing things like this as I'm entering startup contests as much as I can and uh, looking for a co-founder to help tackle the workload. So it's going to spread gradually, but surely. So. Okay, we're going to open it up. Uh, we got a question here to your left. Okay, first question, If I think the concept is really, really solid, obviously, knowing about events and being able to attend. But there's a lot of events that are going to be promoted that I don't want to hear about, I don't want to know anything about them. Is there, a, is there a process where you can filter, so I can set up a profile on the Gather website where I only want to know about things that are of interest to me? Yes, sir, there are. Uh, so when you're adding in those interests, uh, that's basically how it happens. When they're creating their events, they're, going to, they're only going to get two tags to put on theirs. You're going to get as many as you can. This prevents event hosts from just putting in anything and being able to spam everybody. They only get two tags per event. So that would be how you, you won't hear anything about it. OK, we got a question in the middle here. Um, first off, I'm really glad you're in KC because you're awesome and whatever you do is going to be awesome. Thank you. Um, but I, I would suggest that um, that you find a more narrow niche um, and focus more on maybe like kids events or, or something because it's going to be very, very, very difficult to take on Eventbrite and meet up in the other platforms that are probably already trying to take them down. So the more you can narrow your customer focus and who you're actually targeting, the more successful you're going to be. Right. Thank you. And check out Pipeline. Dot com. Google Pipeline for Kansas City. You, you would oh, be right, right there, yeah. right? Thank you. One more in the middle. Hi, I'm Chance again. Uh, great presentation, great idea. I hope you the most of success. Uh, this one's not so much about the business. You say you come up here because you love it. You saw the Kansas City Startup Village and went, that's awesome. I want to be a part of that. How's that going for you? Uh, it's going great. I can honestly say that I would not be here if uh, I did not have these connections that I've made in the short amount of time I've been here since January. I think the 800 mile drive was, uh, I think it would have been worth it just having met Chris Barron, who does Traveling Nuker. So, uh, and uh, Ben Barrett and uh, you know, Adam is a great leader of uh, the Kansas City Startup Village and getting everybody connected, keeping people in the know. Uh, th there's a lot that I don't have to go out and look for because of guys like him. And uh, there's a lot of questions I don't have to ask anymore because of guys like Chris Barron. So that's how it's been working out. Pretty awesome. OK, another question in the middle. Is there some sort of algorithm that goes into when I create a profile it automatically matches the, my interest, or is this something done manually? And is there anything proprietary about your backend software, if there is any? Uh, call me dense, but I forget what proprietary means. <laughs> <laughs> something that somebody else can't copy, or you have the sole rights to do. Uh, it'll, I'll be, the platform is built on Ruby on Rails, so a lot of it will be gems, and so, the algorithm pretty much works like online dating before events, so it happens uh, automatically. Automatic, okay. One of the questions I had, um, and again, from experience, uh, you want to make money on the ticket sales, um, which implies that you're going to build a, your own ticketing platform. Because um, if you integrate any other existing one, they take that money. So is that on your roadmap, or is that um, something you're working on right now? Yeah, I'm working on it right now. I actually have most of it done. It's a lot of it is just like commented out code, the stuff that you just wouldn't see if you went to the site. Uh, I have a little bit more work to do on it before I make sure that uh, you don't get charged $100 for something that's 10. So uh, <laughs> once I get that worked out, it, it shouldn't take very much longer. But I'm doing everything that I can, and uh, I'm coming to events like these to learn from people like you. So uh, I can't give you, you know, an exact timeline just yet. But if you like the page, you'll be able to keep up with uh, what's going on. So. Cool. I could go all day on this one. So is it? You want? I think this question is much for uh, for Adam. What did you feel like the tipping point would be for your your company? Like how many events? How many people on your site did you feel like it was going to be necessary to actually 
trigger and, and, and become a, a stable company. When this is what stemmed from the chicken and the egg comment I made, it was, you know, what we, we struggled with was we did really good at getting people to look at it, but to, to ever use Gather or Local Ruckus, there had to be a lot of events there to feel like it was the best place they could go. Otherwise, they're still going to go to Facebook or, uh, you know, Eventbrite or uh, uh, all of these, uh, uh, you know, event pages that are out there. So we had an intern team loading events so that there was content, and then we were marketing to consumers. And that's, and that's part of what we never did hit that. What we ended up going towards was small towns where we could hit a, a uh, kind of um, that tipping point a little bit easier um, because it was much easier to get all most of the events. Um, so one of the things I would say is as like in a big city, um, it's really hard to break through the noise because um, you have everyone from Anschutz Entertainment Group and Sprint Center marketing to events to the Royals to visit KC to Eventbrite, and that's what's hard. The thing that's intriguing to me, though, and this is sounds like it's part of your strategy, are these niche markets, and someone else alluded to that as well. I would definitely stay focused on there. I, I talked about live music. I wouldn't touch live music unless it's like beatboxing you know, something like that, right. and focus on those. Is that kind of your strategy moving forward? Uh, right now, I'm like, I'm trying to take one niche at a time. I don't know, I'm not gonna even touch anything that I don't actually go to regularly. So uh, I had no intentions of like, trying to get the shoots and ladders games going or uh, <laughs> Halo or anything. So. Uh, I'm a big <laughs> shoots and ladders fan. So maybe I could take that for you. All right, we got a question in the back here. Um, I, I understand that you've only been uh, putting this together for just a few weeks, but have you done any market research to find out what else is already out there that might be competing for your brand name? There's an app that's actually, that someone's in the process of launching uh, called Gather as well, that, that may be taking some of the thunder away, at least from a brand name. Um, I wanted to kind of let you know about that. I know that you're just getting started, but the concept is great. Uh, there, it, you can really take away from what Meetup and some other groups are doing because you're doing it in a more crowd version. So um, the reason that I actually even started this endeavor is because if you ask anybody who participates at the events that we go to, um, we don't know about Eventbrite. None of them. I have yet to meet even one. And so we're a pretty significant part of the population. And this is just my niche that I'm talking about. Um, if you go and type in breakdancing events on meetup.com, you'll be hard pressed to find even one in the last half decade if you find it. So um, we don't use these kinds of things because we're already in our circle. We're already connected and know each other. But people like uh, your kids or my kids, um, we want to know about events like these. And so Gather is like, how do you find out about it if you're not already in that circle? So that is our main strategy. And uh, also, if the other Gather has um, the same interest finding algorithm style iTunes genius event, uh, event finding, then I would be surprised, to say the least. But we'll, you know, <coughs> right, we'll work it out, so. I got a question for you over here. Um, first off, fantastic presentation. Uh, you have a great charisma and you can captivate an audience, which is maybe one of the hardest steps uh, when presenting and spreading your brand. Um, and I think you've found something with these niches, something that you're passionate about and something that I just looked on Meetup, there's nothing for skateboarding, breakdancing, any of that kind of stuff. So you've got an opportunity to really connect with that crowd, both because you're in it and because you're very charismatic. Um, it's very hard to start something alone. And you mentioned looking for a co-founder. What does that person look like? Who is that person that complements your skill set and helps you guys as a company be more balanced and help you grow? And how have you tried to kind of find that? That is a fantastic question. Um, your name? Lance. Lance. <laughs> okay. So uh, that's a fantastic question. I've actually tried to partner up with a few guys. Uh, and it just like for it never really works out because they this is a pretty big experiment. I know I'm talking about 
taking down Eventbrite, and I do have plans to do that, but I'm, none, I'm under no illusions that that's going to happen today. Uh, cross your fingers, it might, but um, I, this is a very, this is very experimental here. Uh, I don't have any funding or anything like that, so I'm looking for somebody who can accept that, that we're not going to be rich tomorrow, and just see where it's, it's going to go from there. That's what, a, that's what I'm mainly looking for in a co-founder. Everyone who I've talked to so far has been like, hey, let's bring on a team and talk equity today. And that was before we even had anything built, so. So I would challenge you, um, when you find somebody, don't just accept them because they're willing to hustle. Anybody who starts a startup is willing to hustle and make those sacrifices. Make sure they have the skill set that complements you. If you have two of yous, you guys are overloaded in one expertise. Make sure you take that time and find that person who can help you grow in an area that you're not as skilled at or don't understand. Absolutely. Thank you. Nope. Michael, wanted to thank you for coming out. We want to ask our final uh, patent pending question, and that is, as a community, what can we do for you? Uh, Mostly just go to the page and like it so that you can stay updated with uh, what's happening and uh, where Gather is going to be going. That's the main thing. You'll, you'll be able to stay connected like that. Thank you. Thank you. We've got a uh, special announcement here from uh, Make48. Pull that up on screen. All right, Sean is going to make this announcement for us. All right, that was a great presentation. I don't know what I enjoyed more, the corkscrew, the comments about bridge. <laughs> that was awesome. I'm 50, so anyway, I might be interested in that. Um, I'm the CEO of the Inventor Center of Kansas City, which is 501c3, also supported by Kaufman. We meet here the third Tuesday of every month, and we're promoting the first ever Inventors Challenge here in Kansas City. It's called Make48, so you can find this at make48.com. On Twitter, it's Go Make 48. On Facebook, it's Go Make 48. But make48.com, so a 48 hour inventors challenge. We already have 12 teams that have been selected from multiple, multiple applicants from around the nation. And at 4 o'clock on the 17th, Tom Gray, the CEO of Handy Camel, which is our premier sponsor, will issue a challenge in a category unbeknownst to all the contestants. So it might be garden item, or the great outdoors, or kitchen utensil, or a pet item. But they have 48 hours to design, build a functional prototype, because we'll have fab labs open for 48 hours, staffed by technicians. But they have 48 hours to design, build a functional prototype, shoot a promotional video, and post it on YouTube, at which point a panel will then elect the champion. Our vision for the future is next year we'll do this in 10 cities. And then each champion from each city that will then come to Kansas City to have the, the grand <clears throat> Make 48 make off, in essence, okay? So the whole idea of this is to really, really focus on Kansas City as being an entrepreneurial hub of the entire nation. That's our, our vision going forward. So the Make 48 event, again, is April 17th. Tom Gray, once again, the, the CEO of Handy Camel, is our premier sponsor. Handy Camel is uh, currently on QVC. It was voted the number one garden accessory for 2015 in the UK. They're currently in negotiations with Walmart, and they just recently established their um, global headquarters here in North Kansas City. So it is a international, but Kansas City-based company. So some of the speakers on Keynote Friday, the registration begins, I believe, at 7.15. Our first speaker will be on at 8.30, Friday morning, the 17th. We have a killer keynote lineup that whole day. So Stephen Key, as you see here, <clears throat> he wrote One Simple Idea. He also has One Simple Idea for startups and entrepreneurs. He's made literally millions and millions of dollars in licensing deals. Great dynamic personality. He is going to, all these speakers will be here in person sharing their expertise with you. We have Christy Garten from Ushik, <clears throat> who's actually an expert on how to market to millennials. Uh, another gentleman, um, go ahead and tell me the name here. I got gear. Yeah, hang on. So I can, these are my bridge glasses. <laughs> okay. Uh, TJ Hale from Shark Tank Podcast. I actually wrote a book on, and, um, on how to successfully get your products on to Shark Tank. Uh, Brian Friend has also um, sold millions and millions of products through QVC. 
And pardon me? Okay, and Tom Zaria yeah, is one of the leading reps of getting products onto QVC. He's part of the filtering process of getting it onto QVC. The bottom line is, in Venter Center of Kansas City, along with Handicam, we've invested an extreme amount of money and time to promote, to put this event on. It's going to be hosted at Union Station. The keynote speakers are going to be at the uh, Greater Kansas City Chamber of Commerce meeting room there in Union Station, which is a beautiful, beautiful setup, but it's also a limited venue. There's only 200 seats available. So between the panel, we have about 10 speakers. Some flyers have been passed out around so you can see all of them. Uh, we have some panels on marketing and branding and trade marketing, and we have some intellectual property attorneys coming in. So the expertise that you have exposure to have literally moved billions with the B in product, billions and billions of dollars. So I would, see, I would encourage you to make an investment in your future and <clears throat> attend this event. You can go to make48.com. If you click on speakers, you'll then see an Eventbrite logo there where you can register for the event. But again, there's only 200 seats. Seating is limited. We're going to give away two tickets today. Before you do that, if you get your ticket from 4.30 to 6.30, you get to be a part of a VIP reception with all of the speakers where you get to mingle with them. So that's kind of a big deal. Okay. So when you say get them from 4.30 to 6.30, what do you mean? After the challenge is announced and the teams go off to start their invention process, all of the participants that came to hear the speakers get to hang around in the chamber room and mingle with the speakers and attend the VIP reception. That's correct. But it's not a separate ticket. If you have a ticket to the event, you're a part of it. So yeah, that's not a separate registration. It's part of the event. So if you have tickets, you actually have will come to a private reception afterwards, have the opportunity to mingle, interface with these people. Again, a small venue, so you have the opportunity to speak with them personally. So make 48, click on the speakers, <clears throat> register for that event. But we're giving away two tickets today. So we've got Mindy Hart up front, and we've got Mary Moeller in the back. She's sitting right there in the pink sweater with the, the bucket above her head, little box. Put your business card in there, and we will pull the two winners from that, and you'll get complimentary tickets. Keep in mind, this is a fundraiser. This is our sole financial support for Inventor Center of Kansas City. Again, it's a non-for-profit charitable event, uh, but we would like to see you and have you be a part of that event. It's going to be fantastic, so please support this. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we want to thank everyone uh, for coming out today. A couple of quick things. I believe uh, Velo Plus still has some coffee samples available. Um, also, I think Michael is standing in the back if you want to learn how he did that move on stage. Um, thanks again for coming out. We'll see you all next week. <laughs>